think that's good. Maybe a little higher. Fifteen 
to 18 kilometers from a breeding site for nesting. So when I said before that there's no active flex outside of Grasslands National Park, it doesn't mean that there's no nesting or wintering or root rearing habitat outside of the park in these situations. Um, this is a shot I took last year and it's, it's interesting because there's two species. Yes? <coughs> I just want to make sure I do. Are you saying there are no leks outside of grasslands? Yes, that's correct. Well, I beg to differ. I know several leks that are not in grasslands. Okay, then we should talk after the talk. <laughs> um, in our records, at least, there's no leks. No, okay. Yes. That... You know more than I do, then. No, I don't. <laughs> so, um, so these two species, I'd say pronghorn and satyr, share the same habitat. Here and you could just see there was a bunch of males dancing and these prongers just went through the leg and they didn't even care about each other, they just kept their own business. So, um, but they, these two species share the same habitat, so that's how uh, important sagebrush is. And so the distribution of the sagebrush follows kind of the sagebrush distribution in North America. So this is a map of the historic distribution in light green, I don't know if you can see it, and the dark green is the current distribution. You can see the, the, the poor areas are down in Wyoming and then, that there's a lot in Montana and then some of them are very linked to our population in Saskatchewan. And then on the eastern part, I guess, south of Montana. And then we have another area west of the province, really close to the border with Alberta and Montana, on that edge there by Council. And that would be this other area that's more linked to Alberta than actually Montana because there's no habitat on the And then I, I thought I'd show you some pictures because I've been working for, with Satra since 2012. And I can count with fingers on one hand the number of times I've seen a Satra. So uh, it's, I feel lucky every time I see them. I'm, I'm sure some of you have seen them more than me. But um, I just found some very good uh, pictures on the internet about nesting. So you can see a hen um, nesting underneath the Satra. And so that's kind of the nesting habitat that I was talking about. Um, and then there's one of the chicks that are ready to run after their mom as soon as they catch. Um, and so sagebrush really need sagebrush um, in all their life stages. And I mentioned before, they do for bird rearing, for nesting, and for wintering. And also, in the winter, they feed 100% on sagebrush leaves. So they really need that for food in the winter. Whether in the summer, they, they eat other forbs and insects and other things like the chicks in the first part of their lifetime they would um, feed mainly on corals and insects. And then I just found this really awesome picture of a satyr so I thought I'd um, provide it to you guys so you can think a little bit about what we're talking about. This is kind of the, uh, the beauty we're talking about. And then because I'm going to be talking about um, the breeding sites that I mentioned before. So I'm going to be talking about how we try to monitor in places that there's no sage grows or there hasn't been a record of sage grows for the last 10 years or 20 years. We're trying to go back to these places and figure out if the birds are coming back to those sites. So I wanted to show you guys how the display of the males is. When I said before that they, they like to dance for the females, I just wanted to show you what that dance looks like. And then I also want you to, I don't know if you'll be able to hear it, but there's also sound to the video. Um, on 
components right here. This is where we are. So uh, this is the Brazos National Park in green, and then you have all the uh, former PFRA pastures in, in light green. Um, and then this purple, I don't know if you can see it very clearly, but that's the best idea we have of, of where the sagebrush habitat uh, remaining in Saskatchewan is, that it's considered the, the habitat for sagebrush in Saskatchewan. So as I mentioned before, there's some in this area. This is the border with Alberta, border with Montana. We have a bunch of PFRAs here that have good habitat. The area around the console too. And then we have to jump all the way to the uh, Valmarie area and um, in and around both blocks of Grassland National Park. So this is our study area for looking for, uh, for birds in inactive lives. And so I just wanted to go through a little bit of the status in Saskatchewan for the bird. Uh, just as a reference, uh, in 1988, there was about 60, 61 legs active in the province, and the population was about uh, 3,000. It was estimated between uh, 2,800 and 4,100, so in the thousands, in the 3,000, 4,000 range. Uh, the population estimated in 2016 is between 99 and 147 individuals. And um, as I said, that's based on we count the number of males and then we extrapolate to the population. Um, and so you can see the decline. This graph only shows 1994 till the present. And you can see that it kind of goes up and down, up and down. That's normal cycle. But then it reaches a point where it starts going down until it reaches the historic low in 2014 of 18 to 27 individuals. That's the estimate. So we have had, I mean, there's good news. We've had two consecutive years where the population has been increasing. Uh, so we're hoping that this trend continues. But have to see. And then there's a, you know, since in Saskatchewan, kind of the legal protection comes in 1999, and it's considered as endangered under the Wildlife Act, and that's kind of the legal protection of the species in the province. But as you can see, there's lots of uh, lots of other studies that um, led to the uh, to the inclusion of the species under the, the Wildlife Act. As you can see, the decline is very um, extreme. Uh, currently, how we manage for them, they're included in the South of Divide Action Plan. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but that's a federal provincial initiative uh, that uh, came up with a bunch of recovery actions for this area uh, after a lot of meeting with landowners and stakeholders in the area. So that's kind of the management that we're following uh, for city trails. 2012 was the last year that we had a range-wide survey for sage um, We did both aerial surveys, so we flew two helicopters in the whole range, um, and then we had about six crews check on 30 historic sites. Um, we found out that, you know, in a lot of situations, we were going to these places where we didn't find any birds, and we were um, kind of thinking of better ways to do that being like the limited resources that we have both in time and in people, uh, we started thinking about how can we uh, monitor for these sites without actually having so many people on the ground, so it's such a big display. Um, so we didn't identify any new legs. We did find some uh, feathers that we collected. We found some uh, samples that we, we collected in some of the sites. So we kind of knew what sites we wanted to survey for the um, and then from 2013, um, we started thinking we need new ways of surveying for sage um, We can't have this big display uh, every year when the birds are not there and we're checking for historic sites. So what we started doing was using a bunch of different techniques to uh, test and evaluate what, what's going to work for surveying for sage So. Um, we tested trail cameras for detection in 2013, and that, that uh, came out to be like challenging because a lot of the times we're talking about historic records, so we don't really have an exact location maybe of where the net was. 
It could be the center of a border section, it could be the observation point, we don't really know exactly what that historically was. And it could have also been shifted somewhere else. So it was really hard for us to point the cameras in one direction. So we dropped that technique that year. Uh, there's other work with cameras that um, Jesse Carson piloted in 2015, and he was looking at the use of anthropogenic features by predators and trying to test how could you use trail cameras to evaluate that. So he just did a, a pilot that was basically kind of trying to figure out how to set up the cameras. It turns out cows out here would like to check out any any new thing in the landscape. So we had some trouble keeping the, the trail cams on the coast and things like that. So um, that was that. We haven't really gone any, anywhere further with that, but you know, we could set up an experiment now we kind of know how to set up the cameras. But uh, today I'm going to be focusing more in these two uh, methods that we've uh, used for several years now. Um, the automated recording units or VRU cell we refer to it's just a, a microphone, kind of a box that we set up on the ground and that records all the birds in that area. So then we can go back and analyze that in the lab. We don't really need to be out there in the field for a long time. We just set it up and then come back and pick it up in a week or two. Um, so we've been trying to build a recognizer uh, during the last three years, and I'll talk a little bit about a little bit more about that. And this last year, we uh, tested an experiment trying to figure out how far away can we detect the, the birds if they are out there. Mm -hmm. So effective distance of, of the air used and how much, how far away can we detect them and then what's the best way to set them out in the field. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then finally, I'll talk about when we're looking for new legs, because the legs could be, could be uh, shifted in, in another place or there could be new locations we don't know. We're talking about areas that don't have very easy access sometimes. And as I said, we don't have the resources to be out there and looking like everywhere. So we tested a uh, uh, fixed wing that came uh, from Idaho. Um, and it had a cooled infrared and uh, high definition camera technology. And so we flew some of the areas with Infolex. And I'll show you some of the imagery that we got from that project. So I'll start talking about air use. Um, these are the two models that we use, uh, the SM2 and the SM3. You can see here there's some chicken wire that we adapted in one of the microphones to avoid the cows from chewing on the microphones. They really like that for me. We found that chewed by bison and cows and deer. Uh, so we protect them with uh, chicken wire around it. And then we build these um, boards and then we, we just pound them into the ground with rebar. We try to leave them as low on the ground as possible so there's no opportunity for perching for predators on the ground. We're trying, as I said, to monitor the return of greater citrus to an occupied place. We've reduced resources and reducing disturbance to the, to the breeding site. So we're setting these out in the middle of the day. The, the grouse only display around sunrise and sunset. So during the day, they're not really using that site that much. So we can just go in There's been a bit of a change in how we set up air use. We've always used at least two per site. So imagine this is a leg that's square over there. And so this is a microphone, an air unit, and this is another one. And we figure that there's a buffer around the microphones where you can detect the grills. So even if the leg was shifted over here, you could still detect it. Um, and the thing is that we don't really know what that buffer is. So that's what we're trying to find out. And we did an experiment this year that we're still waiting for but we're hoping that we can get that distance and so we can plan accordingly. And this year we tried a different setup that was in grid. And this is because we have some, uh, we were able to borrow some areas from the, from the federal government because we don't really have that many, so we couldn't really set up many. Uh, but sadly we had the opportunity to use them, so we set like a grid of nine ARUs per leg, per historic leg. That would be the leg, and then, so that gives you a little bit more of, a, of an organized area and a bigger area to search for in case that leg is shifted somewhere else. Um, what is a recognizer? So, as I showed the video before, and it has some sound, you could hear the kind of the, the 
bouncing, the bouncing uh, sound. So that's what we're trying to capture in these in these recordings. And a recognizer um, looks at the at the sound of the stage drums uh, that's being recorded usually in a in a kind of an environment that doesn't have a lot of background noise. So it's a very clear sound. So we can find out the frequency of the sound and feed it to the computer. And the computer takes this and recognizes if that sound happens again in any other recording without someone having to listen for the recordings. We're old enough. But we're still finding that there's a lot of hits that there's still a person that needs to be uh, listening to them. So we're still trying to uh, to improve it, but that's that's the idea behind it. So, nice. so I'll talk a bit about the results. In 2013, we set eight sites with ARU class one control. Uh, these places were based on evidence from 2012 where we found feathers and other evidence that the grouse could be around. Uh, and also one of the birds that was translocated from Montana to Alberta flew over Saskatchewan in an area and we were aware of that so we, we selected one site there to check for that too. Um, we left them out there for six to seven days so we just go leave it there and then come back and, and pick it up after that. And we found two positives for sage grouse that year. And I remember that's when I gave another PCAP talk and I was really excited because we had two positive recordings. I think Warren was in that one, I don't know if you remember. But uh, we're, we're really excited that maybe we found something, right? Like maybe we found something. Well, we didn't. <laughs> so, um, oh, you can't really see the colors in this one. Uh, okay. So, what we did after we found those two hits, we went back to those places the following year to try to find where the sage trails were. Uh, and so if this is the, the center of the microphone, the, the leg, let's say the, the historic record that we had was over here. This was the microphone that came back positive for sage trails. So we established a bunch of buffers that you can't really see, but uh, 500 meters buffer to check for sage trails in the times when they're supposed to be displayed. So we went back to these sites and tried to find the birds in the mornings um, twice during that season. And in this specific one, we found a shark tail grouse leg not too far away or right here. So, you know, we thought maybe it's the shark. We we're not sure, but the chances are it's not going to be the same. But we still went back and, and set more air use in these sites and other sites. So 2014, we did check those two positives. We didn't find sage grouse. And we set up eight additional sites, including the two positives from the previous year. We left them between three and 15 consecutive days, and we sent them to the lab. And they do it, and three positive sage grouse came. So we're like, OK, maybe this time. So 2015, we went back and checked for those sites again. Uh, and we found more sharp tail grass legs. So we were now pretty sure that the recognizer wasn't really picking up sage grass, it was picking sharp tail grass. Uh, so we set up six more sites, but we also focused on this action over here, obtaining good quality recordings from an active leg in the park that was able to feed the recognizer again and improve it. The thing is that the first time we uh, developed the recognizer was based on the University of California recordings that were very professionally recorded with no background noise and also they were from a different place so we think locally uh, the sound was maybe a bit different so we were not really having a good result with that. So this recognizer proved to be way better because we rerun the positives from the two years that we had and they were, they were uh, negatively identified for stage groups. So now we were pretty sure that we had a good recognizer, a better recognizer, I shouldn't say it's, it's very good yet, but it is better at identifying sharpness. Again, stage groups because we have better recordings for stage groups now. And then 2016, we don't have the results yet, but we, we monitored two historic locations with that grid of nine areas that I showed you before. And we'll, we'll get the results in the next two or three weeks. So then, uh, this 2016, we also tried an experiment trying to test how
how far away can an area you detect sage grouse? If there was a sage grouse there, can we think that it's a uh, hundred meters away, or can we detect that to six hundred meters? Because that makes a difference. If you're setting something up here, and you can, you know, you have a wide range, then you don't need to set up areas very close together. You can have a bigger area searching instead of having uh, all the areas together. So what we did was we developed this setup. We used two active legs in the park, one with not very many nails, and then one bigger leg. So we're trying to get that sense of if we were going to find a new leg, uh, if it was small, we also need recordings for that kind of size. So what we're trying to do is determine as a <coughs> detection, and then also continue to collect high quality recordings for stagers at different distances too. So now if we set up an area you and the stagers are far, we're going to be like, more likely to still detect them. Uh, better than if we only are using recordings that are very close and very good recordings. So that's what we're hoping. Um, I tried to get preliminary results for this talk. Uh, the UVA is working uh, on the recordings as of right now. And they couldn't give me any like threshold yet, so we don't really have that magic number that's going to solve our lives. But um, they've had lots of hits on the, obviously, on the recordings because they're active like so we were expecting lots of hits. But there's still a lot of false positives. So false positives means the recognizer is saying it is citrus, but it's really not. So they still need to listen to the recordings. And what they're working on now, and I'm not going to go too deep into this because it's confusing enough for me, but uh, they're trying to figure out if, they, if there's a way of. Um, the recognizer every time it, it hits a recording, it gives you a score of how likely that is in terms. So they're trying to figure out you know, if there's a magic number that will tell you um, how many hits do you need to uh, have over a score for it to be more likely to be in terms. So we don't really need to listen to the recordings, we can just hit play and it will tell us, you know, 80% chances this is going to be a in terms. That's what Uh, the second method I wanted to talk about is the infrared. So as I said, we had uh, fixed wings that came and tried to detect new legs or shifted legs in areas with high density of satyrs or close to high uh, density areas. And so we can survey over large areas. Uh, we don't have a little bit, or we don't have very good ground access in some of these areas. And as I said, the last time we did a range-wide survey was 2012, so we were wondering if we could use this technique to do a range-wide survey again. So it was kind of a pilot this year, we were just kind of testing the ground to see uh, how well this technique would work. Um, and we tested that the method actually distinguishes quite well between uh, sagebrush and sharp tail grubs, so that's, that's positive. And then uh, we were worried a little bit about the noise, the disturbance to the birds of fly a fixed wing river. And we found that the birds didn't really uh, get disturbed because we have the video recordings that they do from the leg when they were doing videos. So this is the area that we flew this last spring. Um, Ministry of Environment selected an area around the East Block of National Park. <coughs> about 40,000 hectares that we built on the site. And then Environment Canada pitched in because we were really the, the company from Idaho, so we, it was cheaper for us to kind of put efforts together and have two areas going at the same time. And so they flew an area in Battle Creek and Goma Hill pastures. Um, and there's a little bit of the method here, the transits are spaced 400 meters or a quarter of a mile. And they fly at a high of 500 meters. We're still it was still loud when you were on the ground, but the birds didn't seem to be disturbed. Uh, it took five days total to fly this whole area, and there was one weather day, so it was really four days. And the start time was 4.39, so quite early for flying over populated areas. We were okay in this area. Um, so they found more control active left. Um, we only counted half a minute. So we're a little bit concerned they either didn't find the, the area itself, like the whole area, or they maybe the birds were in there. We didn't want anyone to be at the active like that day.
safe because I would have hinted the pilots that there's something in that area, so we wanted to test how well they were, how good they were at detecting the leg, but we can't really tell how many birds were there that day. Uh, no birds were disturbed, as I said, and in the full area they found another four sharp-tailed grass legs between 15 and 35 individuals, and they also reported uh, hides as they saw. So those are some of the results for the infrared. Now, uh, so as I said before, this is how a uh, sage grass leg looks, right? You can see all the males, all the white dogs here. They're dancing, they're, they're displaying. Um, and as I said, they're kind of individually doing that. They're not really uh, interacting with each other. And so you can actually see very well in the infrared video that I'm going to show you when I'm going to do that. Look for the details. You can actually see the bouncing of the chest of the satros. And you can see they're like individuals. The males are not interacting with each other. They're just minding their own business. So I want you to look at that because then I'm going to show you a sharp tail leg short tail grass legs, sorry. So you can kind of see the difference in behavior, and I'll go over the behavior of the other birds in a little bit, but I just want to show you the, the sage grass video. So this is the infrared camera, and you can see the, the white dots out of the males. And if you look, like you can see the this one and that one are very active. You see the bouncing? Pretty neat. So you can actually see how they're displayed. So what they do, they usually have, this is the infrared camera, and then they have a high definition camera too. They can switch back and forth. each 
other tails up and they're kind of strutting around and going in circles. So I want you to remember that when you see this next video. Because it's pretty cool how you can see that. Um,
uh, if you have further questions, comments, there's also my email. Yes? So, so when you say fixed fixing, are you talking about the full size aircraft? There's two technicians that did the camera and there's the pilot. So currently the camera is like underneath. Yeah, and then they can like put it in. I have a question. Um, you showed the graph about um, like the status of sage grouse, the population numbers, and it really dropped in 2014 and then was coming back again in 2015. Do you know why it dropped and why it started coming?